Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Go ahead and open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me. We'll be picking back up in that study. Uh, this morning I was at uh, Delphi, and I'm kind of trailing behind there with where I am here in Paul's epistles. And I did uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 there with them. And when I did that one here at Gadsden, it was 43 minutes. And uh, when I got to verse 7 there in Delphi this morning, I looked up and a half an hour had passed. And so I was thinking, oh boy, I better hurry this up. <clears throat> so all that to say that when I practiced at home this fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, it was only 65 minutes. So uh, no, I'm teasing. It, it, won't, it won't take that long. Uh, we do have, though, uh, at least two very unique um, uh, instances that, that would, that would uh, require our attention and some further analysis as we get into uh, each and every verse of First Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you would, go ahead and follow along with me uh, as we read through that. We'll go through the first two verses to start. He says, finally then, brethren, <clears throat> we, request, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So here Paul begins this fourth chapter and he indicates that he's kind of starting to wrap up. Okay, he does still have a whole other chapter after this to go. But he says, finally then, brethren, so, he, so the implication is he's coming to a conclusion. <clears throat> he's delivering to them some final words, either of encouragement or admonition. And he says, uh, he requests and exhort them to do this thing. And that's like saying, uh, you really should do this, right? So a request can just be, you know, uh, asking someone to do something. But when you say, I request and exhort, uh, you're saying, this is really for your betterment. This is a good thing for you to do, and I think you should do it. So I request that you do this thing, but I exhort you to do it as well. In other words, Paul basically is saying, you should, you should do this. Uh, he's saying <clears throat> that he requests and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. Uh, this is both an expression of Paul's authority to speak words from God, but also one of fellowship. So... He's requesting and exhorting in the Lord in that he has the authority to speak on behalf of the Lord in certain spiritual matters, but also they're all in the Lord, right? He's speaking to fellow Christians, and so in the Lord, in other words, together in fellowship, he requests and exhorts them of this thing. Uh, Paul has instructed them of these things before, <clears throat> and we can only assume that that was when he was with them. Uh, for the three weeks that he was with them, as we read about in Acts chapter 17, and we've covered that for the in the first chapter, we covered that extensively. Uh, and he indicates that they're doing well. Uh, he says, continue to do better, though. He says, as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God. So in other words, the way they are to behave, the things they are to do. And then it says, and your Bible may have this in parentheses, just as you actually do walk. That parenthesis is usually an indication that uh, this was not included in the King James, the kind of the first English translation, but it was included in later revised versions because it was found in earlier dated manuscripts. So manuscripts that had more clout to them, manuscripts that were more complete or dated earlier and were closer to the time of the actual written copy uh, that Paul would have written to the Thessalonians. So just so you know, that's typically what that means uh, in your Bibles. He says that you excel still more. This is the first occasion that we'll read uh, that he uses this phrase, excel still more. Something they're already doing well, they're to keep doing well, do better, right? Always continue to, to continue to do, do better in that regard. In verse 2, the emphasis that he has told them uh, these things before by Jesus. So the Lord teaching and commanding through Paul, not merely what Paul wants them to do, right? Uh, you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So he's, again, this is a very explicit statement that Paul is teaching by the authority of Jesus uh, in the way that he instructs them, okay? Uh, this also is a good verse to use for the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Paul is just very uh, bluntly saying there, he gave them commandments by the authority of Jesus, right? So he was inspired to tell them these things. 
Okay. Uh, verses 3 through 6. So one thing before we get into this, one thing that uh, you'll find is very common of uh, Paul's letter to the Gentile churches <coughs> is that uh, one of the one of the habits or practices or characteristics of a Gentile church is that uh, sexual immorality was something that was not necessarily shunned upon in that culture, in the Gentile culture. And so as, when they became Christians, that was something that they needed extra teaching on. They needed extra admonition on that particular aspect of their sanctification or their holiness. And so in almost every letter, uh, it's particularly there evident in the letter to the Corinthians, he will teach them and uh, admonish them on that in that regard. And he does so here in verses 3 through 6. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because of the Lord, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Okay, so in verse 3, <clears throat> when he says that this is the will of God, there's, there's two ways that Scripture describes the will of God. The first is an outright command or decree. God wills it in the sense that he has commanded us to do a thing. The second is a desire that God has of us, okay? Okay. Uh, he desires us to do well. He also commands us to do well and not sin and everything. But it is God's desire that uh, we we do well, that we are that we are holy. Uh, so in that sense, it's His will that we do well. So one of those things, a command and a decree, cannot be. You know, we can't change that whether that command is is true or whether that comes to pass. But insofar as it's God's will or His desire for us to do something. We can mess with that all over the place, right? We, we fall short all the time, and so we fall short of God's will or God's desire for us to reach a certain standard all the time. And that's what he's talking about here. This is the will of God. This is God's desire, your sanctification or your purification, your holiness. Uh, a lot of times today you'll hear people talk of sanctifi sanctification as being an ongoing process. And... and and to an extent, that's true. You're, you're continually trying to become more holy. You're ch continually trying to excel still more, as he says in verse 1. And that's a process that starts when you're baptized and continues until you pass. Uh, and the goal being you are always getting better. You're always improving. You're always becoming more sanctified or more holy, more pure, uh, as the case may be. So when he says sexual immorality here, he's talking about uh, fornication. This is the Greek word porneia, and this is capturing all kinds of sexual immorality. Okay, so homosexuality, bestiality, everything that runs, runs the gamut. <clears throat> Verse 4, uh, this is one of the, when I mentioned earlier, one of the unique parts of this chapter that we'll dive into a little bit more. And, and it doesn't seem like it would be in, in, until we get to a certain word. He says, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? Except for that word vessel. You may have in your margins, I do in mine, uh, an alternative translation to this is wife. Wife. Now that's kind of strange. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that fits there very well. If, if that were translated wife, it would really change the way we're reading following verses especially. Um, let me get back to my notes here. <clears throat> so vessel there is sometimes translated as wife. Uh, and very you know, pronounced scholars like Augustine, one of the first uh, Christian scholars, uh, he preferred this translation of vessel here. Uh, support from, for that translation can be taken from 1 Peter 3, verses 7 where he talks about uh, the weaker vessel, referring to a, a man's wife. Uh, this makes some sense if we read verse 6. So look at verse 6 again with me. That no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, the matter being sexual immorality, and transgressing or defrauding your brother, mean, meaning being sexually immoral against his wife or, or a significant other, whatever the case may be, defrauding him in that way, in fornication. Okay. So we can fit it in there a little bit, 
but it doesn't make a lot of sense in verse, with verse 5. So look at verse 5. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. It doesn't, doesn't seem like wife is a very uh, good translation for the word used there. All other translations of the Greek word here, which is skeus, S-K-E-U-O-S, all other translations in the New Testament are vessel or some kind of a container, okay? Um, if we remember uh, Peter referring to what was, what was lowered down to him in his vision uh, in Acts chapter 10, uh, where all the unclean animals were there and God told him to eat, uh, he uses this Greek word skeus, a vessel, a container of some kind carrying all those unclean animals. Um, and even in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, the word itself is translated vessel, but we understand that it's a metaphor for a wife. Okay, And in the context there, it's very clear that he means wife for that Greek word. The context here in 1 Thessalonians 4 is not clear that it means wife. And so predominantly every translation you're going to read is not going to say wife, it's going to say vessel, but you may have footnotes that say wife. And so that's where that comes from. It's, it's taking this word vessel as it's metaphorically used in 1 Peter 3, 7, the weaker vessel, the wife, and applying that in this instance where you can maybe see in the context where you could pull that out of there, but it really doesn't fit very well. So vessel is the is the correct translation of the words of the Greek word skeus here, um, and it's predominantly seen to refer to as your own body. So even here, it's a metaphorical use. Uh, vessel here means your body, right? So if we read that there, that each of you know how to possess his own body in sanctification and honor, and it's really going to make a lot more sense once we get to verse 8, that he's talking about your own body. It'll really, I think, really secure that translation in there. So if you didn't know at all about that alternate translation of this word vessel, then maybe I'm throwing a thorn in your side here, but, but don't worry about it. It's, it's something that some scholars think it could be wife. Most do not, and I don't think it fits in the context here uh, at all. Okay, in verse 5, uh, fornication was a particular problem, like I mentioned, for Gentiles and Gentile uh, churches. Uh, not, it was not seen as a sin in their own culture. So Paul points out that they are now Gentiles that know God, as it says there in verse 5. And so they are called to a higher purity. They're not Gentiles that don't know God. And so it wouldn't be a big deal in that sense um, as far as judging one another that it's, a, that it's an impure thing. But they do know God. They do know the commands that are on them. They do know better. And so he's saying... Uh, not in lustful passions like Gentiles who do not know God, because you do know God. You, you are Gentiles who do know God, and you know the commands, and we've, we've told you about these things before. In verse 6, again, like I said, the matter that he talks about here is sexual immorality, so the transgression or the defrauding would be something in that vein. Okay, uh, Verse 6 is, is kind of a very censored way of describing uh, sexual defrauding or transgression of your brother. Um, uh, the scholar Wordsworth says it like this. Uh, he says, this is an example of the modest reserve and refined delicacy which characterized the apostles' language in speaking of the things which the Gentiles did without shame and thus by a chaste bashfulness of words commending the duty of the unblemished purity in deeds. Okay, so a chaste bashfulness of words He's trying to put it as delicately as he can, so he says transgressing and defrauding his brother in the matter, the matter being sexual immorality, fornication, porneia, uh, all of those things. <clears throat> and of this, he says, finishes up in verse 6, uh, we, they have told them before and solemnly warned you. So they know better. Paul's told them about these things before. So even in that short time that he was with them, those three weeks, uh, he told him about these things. He covered sexual immorality with him uh, when he was with them. Okay, verses 7 through 8 says, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So more generally now, uh, impurity here just means general unwholesomeness or uncleanliness, right? So he's stepping back from the specific 
idea about sexual immorality, and he's speaking just in general purity. Uh, he has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 8, he refers to a rejection of either the specific command against fornication or the general call of holiness. Uh, he is not rejecting man or Paul, so he's not rejecting something Paul is saying, but Paul says this person is rejecting God. So this is another uh, time in which Paul is saying, the words I'm commanding you, the words I'm teaching you are from God. They carry his authority uh, coming from me, his messenger. And so you're not rejecting me, Paul. You're rejecting what God has said through his messenger. Okay, and so that we have here in the first eight verses two very clear claims of Paul that his words are inspired, that they carry the authority of the Lord, uh, and so they are to be taken seriously. And so this is why, you know, a lot of people today will say, well, you know, Jesus never taught on this or that specific thing. You know, I don't find that in any of the red letters in the Bible. And we, we could point to verses like these and say, you know, the letters in black are just as important as the letters in red because they are all inspired uh, with the authority of, of Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in verse 8, uh, he basically says he's making a, a sort of an abridged or an abbreviated version of what he tells the Corinthians regarding how they are a temple of the Holy Spirit now. Okay, so he says in verse 8, uh, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is basically what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. If you want to write that in your margin, he's saying, Do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who is given to you by God? Uh, so for these reasons, and I think this is what secures the fact that he's talking about the vessel being your body and not the vessel being your wife back there in verse 4, uh, you have been given the Holy Spirit. It is in you. So you, you, you are to keep your vessel pure, right? He has not called you to impurity. Keep your vessel pure. He's called you to sanctification. He's called you to pureness uh, and uh, purification and holiness, okay? Remember, too, uh, this is a good sort of background, like thinking um, practically about this. We covered in chapter 3 how we know that Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this letter to the Thessalonians. And so knowing what Paul would later then write to the Thessalonians about your temple being a temple, your body being a temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, he has that on his mind when he's with the Corinthians and dealing with them with a lot of these same sexual, uh, sexually immoral issues. And he's, and he's relaying that message on to the Thessalonians and he's saying, you've received the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is in you, so don't be impure. Be holy. Be sanctified. Okay, verses 9 through 12 now. He says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. All right. So verse 9, uh, he shifts focus here. He's leaving the, you know, sanctification, impure, sexually immoral discussion and admonition of them. And he's switching his focus to brotherly love. Uh, this is distinguished from love generally or love of a spouse or love of a child. Those are different. He's talking about love of the brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the love that they share for one another. When he says that they are taught of God, I think that's in reference to the impact of the Holy Spirit on them. Okay, he just mentioned how the Holy Spirit is in them, and then he's talking about how they're being taught by God to do this, this one thing, the brotherly love thing, really well. Well, that's not because they've received come, some kind of special revelation. That's because that's the work of the Holy Spirit in them to be able to express their brotherly love uh, very well, commendably, right? Uh, they, they're very good at this particular thing, and they do it to everyone, not just those in Thessalonica, but in all Macedonia. Okay, remember that, that 
in all Macedonia, that contains Philippi, that contains Berea, that contains Apollonia, all those four, five, six cities in Macedonia that Paul went through as he was coming through Thessalonica. And then uh, in verse 10, he says that they are to excel still more. This is the second time he's used that phrase. Now, l look at where it's placed. We have the first two verses where he's commending them on something, but he says, excel still more. And now we have this verse 10. He's commending them again on something, and he says, excel still more. So the message is never be satisfied with being good at brotherly love or um, walking as you should walk, right, as it says in verse 1. Don't be satisfied just being good at it. Be great at it. Excel still more at these things. Do even better uh, than, you, than you're doing now. So never be satisfied with that. Uh, verse 11. Uh, this verse is kind of interesting. I want to get into this a little bit. Uh, this verse is, is often oversimplified to basically mean mind your own business or stay, stay detached, stay neutral, stay in your lane kind of thing. That would be a very strange thing to tell someone who you just praised for extending their brotherly love all over Macedonia. They're not minding their own business in the sense that we, we mean that expression, right? They're not, uh, they're not keeping their nose out of other people's business. They are going into the, the business of their brothers and sisters and helping them and extending their love towards them and doing what they can for them. So Paul doesn't mean it in the way of mind your own business kind of thing, keep to yourself. That's not exactly what he means here, okay? When he says, <clears throat> um, lead a quiet life, he's talking about don't be unruly, don't be given to unrest, don't be riotous, so un avoid that type of a lifestyle, don't give in to that type of thing. When he says attend to your own business, he means do the work that you are called to do. And when I say work, I mean your job or your profession. Attend to your business. Do your work. Okay? One thing that, one thing that was a habit of some Gentiles as well is that they would, they would just stop working. They would be lazy. And we, we'll see in a moment here one of the reasons that perhaps the Thessalonians may have uh, fell to this. Uh, and many other Gentiles, is that they thought Jesus was coming back really soon. So it's kind of like, well, why do I need a job? Jesus is coming. He's going to take me away. I don't need to worry about making money or anything. Um, so we'll see that in a moment. But attending to your own business basically means take care of your things. Uh, attend to your profession. Attend to your job. Okay? <clears throat> when he says work with your hands, then, that's either a general uh, sort of command or encouragement for physical activity, or it's a specific reference to the majority labor force in Thessalonica, that most of these people were people who worked out in the fields or worked with their hands doing things. Uh, it's probably that latter. It's probably that the Thessalonians, uh, most of the Christians there were people who worked with their hands and they weren't, uh, you know, pen pushers or, or whatever the equivalent phrase would be for people in the in the first century. Um, uh, tax collectors, maybe, I'm not sure, but people who just sat at a desk all day, people like me in my job. He says, work with your hands, be active, be engaged in your work. Don't just sit on the sidelines, okay? He's encouraging them to movement and motion here and engagement in all kinds of things, right? So we don't need to equate that with just saying, you know, keep our nose down, keep out of other people's business, just don't make, a, don't make a ruckus kind of stuff. He doesn't want us to make a ruckus. That's, that's part of leading a quiet life, right? Don't be unruly. Don't be, don't be a riotous person. Uh, but he's not, he's not going to the extent of saying, just mind your own business. Don't worry about anyone else, right? That's not exactly the message that he's getting across here. Okay, verse 12. Uh, all of these things then that he says in verse 11 is in order to govern your behavior and your need of anyone outside of Christ. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, the brethren will supply whatever needs for your own work, where your own work falls short. Okay, so say, for example, uh, you, are, you are a widow, and you are still working, perhaps, but you will, the work that you're able to bring in is just not getting it done. It's not providing uh, the things that you need, your own shelter, your own food, and those things. 
Well, the brothers and sisters in Christ are there to help you do that. Don't rely on those outside the body to provide those things for you. Okay, we, we have a sense of this kind of command that he gave to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, when he says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So don't be taking favors from unbelievers. The brotherly love exists partly for that reason, to help each other out. It's not just about sharing one another's, one another's like spiritual burdens, like uh, he implies in Galatians chapter 6. It's about sharing one another's physical burdens, uh, financial burdens, everything, right? We are a, to be a community, a spiritual community, uh, sharing in one another's worldly and physical trials, okay? We help each other out with those things. So he's saying, make sure you don't put yourself in a position where an outsider now has leverage over you, okay? Turn to your brothers and sisters if you need help with things. Uh, if, if you've come to a place where your work falls short and you're not able to provide for yourself, turn to your brothers and sisters and, and look for those things. And, most, and also he says behave properly towards them. That gets back to the idea of sanctification. Be holy among the outsiders because you are an example of the church to their eyes, right? Okay, verses 13 and 14 now. <clears throat> He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So these, these last few verses are that next kind of unique part. Uh, we don't find a lot of discussion like this in Paul's letters, but we do in Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians. So what he's touching on here is called eschatology. So that's a big $5 word for you. That basically just means the study of the end times. It's what's going to happen at the end of this age, at the end of the world. When Jesus comes again, what's going to happen? What's that going to look like? That's called eschatology. And so he moves from talking about brotherly love to addressing their concern over those who have died, right? So that's what he means when he says over those who have fallen asleep or who are asleep. This is a very common New Testament phrase referring to someone who has passed. Uh, this is how uh, the, the uh, scripture refers to Lazarus. This is how it refers to Stephen who fell asleep. Um, so that this is talking about people who have died. Okay, There was apparently a fear among the Thessalonians that, they, that the, those who were in Christ, their fellow brothers and sisters, who had died... We're going to miss the return of Jesus and not be in heaven with him because they had died already. So the expectation from the Thessalonians with that was that this is something that was going to happen very soon. Now, where they got that idea, it doesn't tell us, and we don't know. It could be anywhere. Um, Paul will address it a little bit, sort of by inference uh, in a moment. But they had the idea that this was coming very soon. And they were worried, and you can see how we can go from addressing their brotherly love to now addressing a concern they have over their brothers and sisters who have died. Okay, so there's an easy logical progression there. So he says, though, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Okay, so there's two things there. One is the faith and the hope that we have in the fact of Christ's resurrection. Okay, if you believe that, then it should be easy. It should be no big deal for you to believe that God's going to raise those who have died. Okay, God's going to raise them uh, because he raised his son Jesus. And Jesus told us that, uh, he, that he would raise us to him again and, and join us with him. So the hope is still there for them. Uh, their grief is not the same. Okay. We need to stress, though, the second thing, it's only those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Paul is not referring here, or he, and he doesn't even address at all those who are out of Christ, those who are not in Christ, who have died. He doesn't address them. He doesn't say what's going to happen to them. He is only addressing the Thessalonians' concern over their brothers and sisters who have already died. And that's going to be very important when we look at another word specifically, because the word will carry with it a lot of baggage, and we need to make sure we keep constrained to what specifically Paul is talking about. So he's talking about those who have 
died in Christ. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, then don't worry. These people are going to rise again too. God's going to raise them as well. Okay? <clears throat> All right, verses uh, 15 through the end of the chapter now, and then we will wrap it up. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, by specific revelation, uh, he says, we say to you by the word of the Lord. He's, Paul's saying, we, we know that we've learned this from the Lord. God has told me this. Paul assures them that living Christians will not precede those who died. And more in line with their concern, I think he's basically saying they are not going to steal or replace the glorification that is due to those who have died in Christ. Okay, They will still be glorified. Those alive when Christ comes are not going to trump or in any way steal the, the glory from those who have died in Christ. They, they will go first. Okay? Uh, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So those who have died will go first, right? They're going to they're gonna go before anyone who is still alive. And so let's address that, what, what Paul says there. We who are alive. It's suggested by some who, who break down these verses that when Paul says we who are alive, uh, and then in 17 says uh, we who are alive and remain, it's suggested that by saying that, Paul also believes that he will be around when Jesus comes again. And I, I can under, you can understand that assumption, right? He says we, he's grouping himself in with people who, are, who will be alive when Jesus comes. But he, we don't need to conclude that he thought that he would be alive at the time. Okay, this can just mean the general we as in Christians. So Christians who are alive... Christians who are alive and remain. So not necessarily Paul specifically having him in mind that he will be there as well. Uh, because there are plenty of other places where Paul indicates this is a time that is unknown. Uh, it's going to come like a thief in the night. right? In, in chapter 5, if we look at this in verse 2, he says, You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So he's saying there pretty plainly, you don't know when it's going to come. It's going to be a surprise. You're going to be caught off guard, perhaps. We don't know when it's going to come. And he says in 2 Thessalonians, uh, let's see if I wrote it down. I did not. In 2 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter, I think it's chapter 2. He lists off, we'll get to it when we get to the Second Thessalonians, obviously. But he lists off a number of things that must occur before Jesus comes again. Okay? And so for him to expect that he's going to be around when all these things can happen is maybe a little bit of a stretch. So we don't need to state outright that Paul believed he was going to be around for the second coming. He could just be inferring that we, as in Christians... Uh, we who are alive, Christians who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay, that, that can just be very, very simply what he means here. We meaning Christians who are alive. So in verse 16, <clears throat> uh, the literal appearing of Jesus is pointed to here. He says, the Lord himself will descend. Uh, he ascended to the right hand of God, and that's described for us in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, if you want to write that in your margins. So he ascended to the right hand of God into heaven, and he will return in the same manner. Okay, it says that also in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The shout here in verse 16 is to imply a call or an authoritative command. Okay, it's a shout with some authority behind it. Okay, it's not just a, a shout to announce something, it's a shout to call forth someone. Okay? Some say that this shout is from Jesus, 
Some say that this shout uh, is from the archangel that is referenced next. And you can kind of read it both ways. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. So is the archangel the one shouting or is it Jesus shouting with the voice of an archangel? It, it's hard to sort of delineate that. Then it says, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Second uh, Thessalonians 1 verse 7, that he, chapter 1 verse 7 says that he will be accompanied by angels. Matthew 24 verse 31 indicates that Jesus blows the trumpet which commands his angels. Uh, so we've got, we've got a few things happening here that can be a little confusing. Just reading them on the surface, piecing together all these places that we have, uh, the, the pieces of descriptions of what this event is going to look like. The important thing to remember here, as it pertains to the Thessalonians, is the very last part of verse 16. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's what they are concerned with. Okay, And that's what Paul is addressing. They are worried about the dead in Christ missing the second coming because they're dead. But Paul says, no, they're not going to miss it. They'll go first. Okay? They're going to rise first. Before we have started ascending or doing anything, they're going to rise first. And so knowing that, knowing the emphasis that Paul's here, we can look at the re that Paul is placing here on that order. We can look at the rest of verse 16 and say, okay, we don't need to necessarily pull a timeline out of this, the rest of verse 16. We don't need to have it exactly correct. Who's doing the shouting here? Is it Michael the archangel? Is he blowing the trumpet or is it Jesus? Uh, what's it say in this verse? Verse that? That's not the purpose of what Paul is describing here for the Thessalonians. He's telling them the dead in Christ will rise first. There's some things going to happen. There will be a shout, an archangel, a trumpet blowing. Some stuff's going to happen. It's going to be loud. You're going to know about it. You're going to see it. It'll be evident. But the dead in Christ will rise first. That is what bring, will bring them comfort. That's what he's addressing. Okay, So that's important to remember. Verse 17, he says, Then we, remember, he's, that means Christians. It doesn't mean Paul thinks he'll be there. Uh, we, Christians who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, Christians will be caught up. This is the other unique part of chapter 4 uh, with one specific word that can throw a wrench in things. And it's that word caught up. You've all heard the word rapture, right? Everyone's pretty familiar with the word rapture. Um, you almost can't be exposed to any kind of Christian culture, especially in America today, without hearing about rapture of some kind. Uh, that word rapture is not a Greek word. It comes from the Latin Vulgate translation of the New Testament. It's from the Greek word rapimur, R-A-P-I-E-M-U-R, which is derived from the Latin verb rapio, which means to catch up, to, to be caught up, to be taken up. Okay, and that's what's being described here in verse 17, right? We who are alive will be caught up, rapio, together with them in the clouds and meet them uh, with the Lord in the air. So <clears throat> we get this word rapture from the Latin term that's translated from the Greek here. Um, and we'll be doing this and we'll be caught up here. We'll be raptured with them in unison or alongside to meet Jesus in the clouds of he and the heaven from which he is descending. The problem is with this word rapture, right? And I only say problem uh, because you use the word rapture and it carries with it a lot of other baggage like a seven year tribulation and actually two raptures, one at the beginning of the seven years and one at the end of the seven years. And where that seven years come from, I don't know, it's not in scripture, but all this baggage from uh, Leahy and the, uh, <laughs> the Left Behind series, all these things that are pretty recent teachings in Christianity uh, writ large, in the last 150 or 200 years, all these things come along with that because it's very popular. It's, it's very kind of fun to read about. You know, there's a whole fictional series about this whole idea. And so you say rapture, and every, all this other baggage comes in with it. Now you can say, yeah, I believe in the rapture. It says it right here. We're going to be caught up. If we're alive, when Jesus returns, we're going to be raptured. We're going to be caught up. 
but you say that to people and they think, oh, you think there's gonna be a seven year tribulation and all these things. No, we, we need to make sure that we clarify that because there is all that other baggage with that word, <coughs> which itself is a Latin word. It's not the, a word that's used by anyone who wrote the scriptures. Uh, so that just adds more onto it. So we need to keep that in mind. That word caught up, rapture is a scriptural teaching. It's the left behind series kind of stuff that's not scriptural, okay? Uh, and you're not going to get any of that additional stuff from what Paul says here. All he says here is that when Jesus comes, we will be caught up with those who have ar- those who had died and have already been raised up with Christ. Okay, and that's all he's teaching here. There is not a teaching about a seven-year tribulation or anything like that. So we're caught up <coughs> together with them. So you know. You can picture them being raised from the dead, right? And then they're being caught up or raptured up to Jesus. And then we are in unison then together with them, along with them, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So as Jesus is descending from heaven, from the clouds, as scripture describes, we are ascending and meeting him in the air. And then it says we'll be with him always at that point. And that's where it stops. You're not going to get anything from Paul of these verses for where that will be, if that will be a physical always or a spiritual always, right? You're not going to get any of that from this. We, we just get very vague kind of references and ideas and pictures in our heads. The point that he's drawing here to the Thessalonians is that they don't need to worry about their brothers and sisters who have already died. They're going to be fine. He says in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. All of this should bring comfort to them. Their concerns should have been put to rest with what Paul describes to them here. So we we should be very careful for what we draw from this in our eschatology, in our study of end times things, or what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, all that stuff. Be very careful that we're not drawing more out of the scripture than what's intended by the authors. All Paul is intending to do is get their minds at ease regarding Christians who had already died who are, are dead when Christ comes again. Okay, that's, that was his purpose here uh, at the end of chapter 4. So that concludes uh, that uh, lesson for us going through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so in as much as the Thessalonians would be comforted in knowing that uh, their brothers and sisters who have died uh, are, going, are not going to miss the uh, rapture, right? They're not going to miss the glorification uh, to be experienced when Jesus returns. In fact, they're going to get it first. Okay, they're good, they're not. We're not going to precede them uh, in that glorification. Uh, so, insofar as that is something to look forward to, that's something that we should keep in, in our minds. And so, all of Paul's uh, exhortations for them to remain pure, uh, to remain holy, continue the love of the, love of the brethren, and excel still more. Uh, walk in the manner that you are that you should be walking and excel still more. All of these things we should be watching out for ourselves so that we can eagerly look forward to that time where we are raptured, where we are caught up uh, with Jesus in the air, or if we have passed, we are resurrected to be met up and caught up with Jesus in the air as well. And that's something we should look forward to. So if there is anything in in your lives that you believe uh, you may be prohibiting you from... um, undergoing that rapture from partaking of that glory of the Lord, uh, then uh, and you have any sins to confess, or if you have any confessions to make before the congregation, uh, we would ask that you do that at this time as together we stand and sing.